Okay, today's lecture, we're going to finally move away from regular aircraft, which use air breathing propulsion, as we've discussed, and instead we're going to talk about rocket propulsion. This discussion is mostly taken from MIT OpenCourseWare Unified Engineering Lectures 5 and 6. So up to now, we've been focusing only on air breathing propulsion. So this is airborne vehicles like aircraft or helicopters driven by adding energy to air that's moving through the propulsion system already. But for other vehicle types, it's more appropriate to use rocket propulsion, which involves expelling mass to generate thrust. Now the advantages of rocket propulsion is that you don't need an atmosphere to generate thrust, and it's mechanically simple. The big disadvantage is that you must carry around everything that you're going to uh, use for propulsion. Um, so in addition to carrying fuel, you also need to carry around your oxidizer. Now, these advantages and disadvantages dictate in which applications rockets are useful. So. And they're useful uh, for short flight durations. And non-reusable vehicles. Due to the mechanical simplicity. So uh, an example um, of both of these uh, objects would be missiles, but also most uh, ships designed to uh, carry people or cargo from the surface of the Earth to outer space, also um, many of them meet this criteria. And of course also related to space, any environment with no atmosphere or a non-oxygenated atmosphere for that matter. So that's just to say that anywhere that you can't use an aircraft uh, with an air breathing propulsion system, uh, you always have the option of using rocket propulsion. So a rocket motor is basically just a combustion chamber it's connected to a converging diverging nozzle and the converging diverging nozzle allows the exhaust gases to achieve supersonic speed so if I sketch out a cartoon of a rocket engine it looks something like this so here's our combustion chamber So in here there's some pressure in the combustion chamber, a temperature, and maybe some velocity. And then if we have a control volume going from the combustion chamber to the exit of this converging, diverging nozzle, and at the exit of that control volume we have the pressure at exit, temperature at exit, and velocity to exit, and there's mass flow coming out this way. So if we look at the first law of thermodynamics for this control volume, there's no shaft or heat transfer. So first law says that the stagnation enthalpy in the combustion chamber must equal the stagnation enthalpy at exit. And if we write this out using the definition of stagnation enthalpy,
we can relate the temperatures and velocities. Now if we assume that the flow from C to E, so in the nozzle, is isentropic, then TE over TC is PE over PC. So gamma minus 1 over gamma. Then if we solve for UE, putting it back into this equation, we get that UE is the square root of QCP TC times 1 minus PE over PC all to the gamma minus 1 over gamma. Now, if you call it the thrust formula, which we first developed when we were talking about air breathing propulsion, um, was that the thrust force F is m dot EV plus AE P minus P naught. Here, there's no term for the incoming velocity um, and mass flow as mass flow is only exiting the control volume um, and not coming in, or exiting the vehicle and not coming in. So, if we consider the case that PE equals P naught as before, then it simplifies a lot and UE is just 2 CP TC square root. And the thrust is just m dot v. Also recall the specific impulse I, which was thrust over the mass flow rate of fuel and gravitational acceleration. Then we can use that to say that m dot EV is m dot g i, so that the impulse is simply u e over g. This is the specific impulse for a rocket.